gentlemen, on the last question, we were discussing the doctrines relating to easement, the right of easement, its effect, and uh, the easement of necessity. The discussion was going on. And we had to start with from the point where we had stopped. But today I received a question. Kindly explain suit for injunction. So stopping the previous topic, I am going to discuss the question of injunction and the suit relating to injunction. Specific Relief Act gives certain provisions which enable us to know as to how specific relief is given. The first and the foremost question is the forum where we have to file a suit and then the relief and its grounds relating to injunction. So far as the forum is concerned, Section 9 of the Specific Relief Act is very much clear. So Section 9 of the CPC is very much clear on the point that civil court has got the jurisdiction to try all sorts of civil nature unless their cognizance is expressly or impliedly barred. So the specific relief act nowhere bars the jurisdiction of the civil court. So the specific relief provides certain reliefs and the methodology how to seek those reliefs. Under section 5 of the specific relief act it has been provided specific relief how given. These are five in number but today we are to confine to the extent of injunction and all other reliefs which have been enumerated in section 5 are also available to a person who is aggrieved who has got a cause of action to get those reliefs. So far as the injunction is concerned it is an equitable relief and provided in a specific relief act. It is to be remembered that the specific relief act provides the equitable reliefs. All reliefs provided in the specific relief act are equitable. So the provisions for getting the relief are based upon equity. The basic principle of equity is that he who seeks equity must do equity. He who seeks equity must come with clean hands. So for the purpose of getting an injunction, the person resorting to the court for the purpose of getting it must do equity and must come with clean hands. So this is the first and the foremost criterion to determine whether the injunction is to be granted or not. Any person aggrieved or any person having the cause of action, if he intends to get the relief of injunction, must do it. So far as the injunction is concerned, it has been provided in specific relief act. It has two portions. Number one relates to temporary injunction and second relates to perpetual injunction. So far as the temporary injunction is concerned, we are not discussing it today because the topic we are to confine thereof is explain suit for injunction. So I am going to explain what the injunction is, how a suit is to be filed, 
and what relief is to be granted by the court in a suit for perpetual injunction. As it is clear from the provision of section 53 of specific relief act, a perpetual injunction can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing and upon merits of the case. The defendant is thereby perpetually enjoined from the assertion of his right or from the commission of an act which would be contrary to the rights of the plaintiff. So the three words in this section are very important. Number one, decree made at the hearing. Number two, rights of the plaintiff. And number three, rights of the defendant. Perpetual injunction can only be granted by the decree means that there can be no perpetual injunction on the basis of an order. Any court having the jurisdiction to grant an injunction must not grant it on the basis of an order. It must grant through a decree. And decree made at the hearing and upon the merits of the case. And there can be no injunction without hearing. There can be no injunction without merit of the case. So what are the merits and what is the hearing? So for the purpose of granting a decree, the court is to determine certain things. So for the purpose of knowing as to how the decree is granted, we are to see the definition of the decree. So section 2, subsection 2 of CPC says, decree means formal expression of an adjudication which so far as regards a matter in controversy conclusively determines as far as the court regarding it the rights of the parties. So under a decree the rights are conclusively determined meaning thereby whenever a suit for perpetual injunction is filed in that suit the rights are to be decided and it should be decided on merit and it should be conclusive determination of the rights of the parties. So the first and the foremost important thing is that perpetual injunction is granted on the basis of a decree of the court. So we have to understand what the decree is and how the decree is passed. The suit starts from the presentation of plate, then the other party is summoned, a written statement is filed, Issues are settled, evidence is recorded, judgment is pronounced, and the decree is followed. So this whole procedure is to be adopted by a court of competent jurisdiction to determine as to a perpetual injunction can be granted or not. The second point is, perpetual injunction can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing and upon merits of the case. The defendant is thereby perpetually enjoined. Perpetually means forever. Forever stopped, forever restrained from assertion of his right or for commission of an energy contrary to the rights of the plaintiff. Meaning thereby that an injunction can be granted even if a defendant has got a right. It is a very complicated situation. Plaintiff asserts that he has a right. The defendant asserts that he has a right. The law says that the defendant shall be restrained from in alleging his right. If again you read the definition, perpetual injunction can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing and upon merits of the case. The defendant is thereby perpetually enjoined from the assertion of his right, meaning thereby that the defendant cannot assert his right. 
a defendant having the right is not allowed to assert the right. It is very strange that in a suit for a perpetual injunction even a defendant can be restrained. I quote an example. A man has a business and he is running business in his shop. He installed power rooms in his own property and started weaving the cloth. The law says that everybody has a right to adopt the pro any profession according to the law to which he is subject. So being a citizen, he has a right to run his power loans and weave the cloths. In front of that property, there is a student studying. And then what happens? The student has a complaint against the power loom owners. I read the books, I study, but during my study, they start running the loans. So they should be restrained from running the ports. The defendant came in the court and said, we have a right. Why we should not weave? Why should we should not earn? It is our business. It is a lawful business. We are doing this business. We are earning from the business and we are paying taxes to the government which are levied on us. So when we have a right to run this profession, to run this business, to earn our livelihood from this profession, why this student is restraining us from doing it? So both have the rights. The student has a right to study at night. The owner of the looms has a right to run the looms and weave the cloths and earn his livelihood. So both have the rights. When both have the rights, the question is whose right should be stopped? and whose right should be maintained. So the law says that the study of the student is not disturbing the loom holder, but the running of the loans is disturbing the student. So the loom owner should not exercise his right to disturb the right of others. <coughs> when both have the rights. So this, meet, this provision meets the situation that when both have the rights, the right uh, infringing the right of others <coughs> should not prevail. In spite of the fact that the owner of the looms had the right to run, but exercise of those rights is an interference in the rights of the plaintiff. Plaintiff says that I am not uh, hindering your way. I am not disturbing your business. I am exercising my own rights and I have to exercise it. But you are exercising your right but destroying my rights. So the provisions of this section. If you again go through, you will find that the decree means formal expression of an adjudication which so far as regards the matter in controversy conclusively determines of the right. So the decree is to be passed. The rights have to be conclusively determined because the decree section 2 subsection 2. And perpetual injunction, what does it say? A perpetual injunction can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing in the pawn merits of the case. The defendant is thereby perpetually enjoined from the assertion of his right. 
Now the defendant should not assert his right. Because assertion of his right is an interference in the right of the plaintiff. So the plaintiff has a good case on merits. He should be stopped. And the second part is that the defendant should not interfere with the right of the plaintiff. In this situation, the defendant has got no right. Only the plaintiff has rights. Where the plaintiff has got the right and the defendant has got no right, in this situation, the right of the plaintiff shall be protected. The right of the plaintiff shall be enforced. The right of the plaintiff shall be taken into account. So where the plaintiff has a right and the defendant has got no right, the plaintiff may seek the relief from the court that the defendant be restrained from interfering with his rights. So the perpetual injunction shall be granted. Perpetual means forever. Up to that time his right exists, the perpetual injunction shall remain in force. Sometimes it happens that the plaintiff dies or he transfers his property whereupon he has the right. So the person succeeding him shall have the same right which the predecessor had. So the right of injunction shall remain after passing the decree forever. So the perpetual injunction means that the injunction forever. Now the question is as to what are the cases wherein perpetual injunction can be granted. So we are to deal with section 54 for the purpose of determining when perpetual injunction is granted. Subject to the other provisions contained in are referred to by the chapter, a perpetual injunction may be granted to prevent the breach of an obligation existing in favor of the applicant, whether expressly or by implication. When such obligation arises from contract, the court shall be guided by the rules and provisions contained in Chapter 2 of this Act. Now, third one is when the defendant invades or threatens to invade the plaintiff's right to or enjoyment of property, the court may grant a perpetual injunction in the following cases. So those are case five cases in which the injunction is granted. So this section 54 has three parts. But these parts cannot be read in isolation. These are to be studied with reference to the previous sections which relate to the perpetual injunction. There should be a right in existence. If there is no right, there is no remedy. So where there is right, there is remedy. And if a person commits breach of the right, a person whose right has been, has been invaded or interfered with may file a suit for perpetual injunction. So the provisions of section 54 while granting the injunction are material. Continues. Nine, nine sir. Continues. So I am going to read section 54. Injunction may perpetual injunction may be granted to prevent the breach of an obligation existing in favor of the applicant 
obligation is of the defendant. So with reference to the previous section, which I have already explained before you, this breach is breach of obligation. Meaning thereby that where there is a right of one party, it corresponds to the obligation of the other. When one says that he has a right in the property, meaning thereby that others have an obligation to keep in their mind that he has a right and they should not commit breach of the right. So restrain the others from committing breach of a right is an obligation. So the first part is that the breach of obligation existing in favor of the applicant, whether expressly by implication. Now the obligations are of two types. Number one, they are expressly provided by the law. That this and this person shall be bound to take care of the rights of others. And there are certain situations when by implication he has got obligation. If the other party has the obligation either expressly or by implication, they are bound to maintain the obligation. The existing obligation cannot be broken. If a person has a threat or invasion on his right, it means that the other person is not is not taking into account his right and may be responsible for committing breach of the obligation. But if he has a threat and invasion on the right of a person, then it means that he is go the other person is going to commit breach of obligation. Then what is the remedy? Where one person commits a breach of obligation, the person having the right may seek the relief of perpetual injunction. So the first part of this is that when there is an obligation, the person obliged to preserve the rights of others cannot be allowed to commit a breach. So in order to prevent him from doing this act, the court may grant injunction. And it is very important that the word may is used and the word shall has not been used. So may is used when it is discretionary with the court. On the one hand, the law is giving him the protection and the other party is bound and obliged to perform their part to maintain his rights. But at the same time, the word may has been used. Why it is so? The word may has been used because the specific relief act is not a relief which can always be granted. When may is used, it means that when may is used, it shall mean that the court has a discretion. But this discretion is not arbitrary. The discretion of the court is not arbitrary. It is judi judicial discretion. And judicial discretion means that the court is to apply its mind judicially and then decide whether the relief is to be granted or not. So this power to the court is given only for the purpose to determine that it is always equitable to grant 
I refuse the grant if a court considers that a person is entitled to a relief claimed, but even then it is not equitable to do so, then the court may refuse it. I give you an example of the may. Suppose there is a student, he has sent his admission form and also deposited the admission fee. All others also did it. But due to error or omission of the examination board, his roll number slip was not issued. All students are ready to appear in the examination, but he has got no roll number slip in his hands. He finds a suit. And the examination should be stopped. I submitted my admission form. I fulfilled all the requirements. I paid the dues and I am entitled to appear in the examination. It is my right. And the board has, is under an obligation to issue me that roll number slip. Can the court grant perpetual injunction? The answer is no. Because it is not equitable to do so. What is fault of the other students? So if the board has committed a fault in not issuing a roll number slip to a one person, at the cost of one person, all students should not be deprived of taking the examination. So we see that the student has a right, the board has the obligation, and there should be this obligation is necessarily to be taken into account and the court may grant to prevent the breach of this obligation but the court may grant in spite of the fact that the court may grant the court shall not grant because it is not a requirement of equity so whenever the perpetual injunction is to be taken into account whether it is to be granted or not and when it is to be granted we are studying this first part of section 54 and uh, we have seen that the word may be granted to prevent the breach of an obligation means that there should be an obligation on the part of the defendant and there should be right of the plaintiff and if there is a threat of our invasion on his right to prevent to prevent that breach the court may grant a injunction and the injunction is granted in accordance with those principles which I have already told you that perpetual injunction can only be granted by the decree made at the hearing upon merits of the case. So after hearing the case, if the plaintiff is entitled to get the decree under section 53, in spite of that section, we are to follow section 54 as well and see that under 54 injunction can be granted or not. So, section 53 is subservient to section 54. Both these sections are to be taken together and thereafter section 56 also to be taken into account which we shall, we shall discuss on the next meeting. Uh, thank you very much for the patient hearing.